Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We have a great show for you this week. We've been driving a lot of interesting things like the Honda Pilot Trail Sport and the Alfa Romeo Giulia Lusso. That's a nice, nice version of it. I've been in the BMW 760i, and we're going to talk about the uh, the selling off of a long beloved Acura TSX that belongs to West Coast editor James Riswick. So with that, I will bring him in. It's been a minute. How are you, man? I'm uh, doing good, dude. It's uh, it's been a it's a fun week with cars around here. I've had a lot of fun blue cars. I traded a pair of uh, boxer engines this morning. A very different uh, ver- uh, vintages. I have a uh, Subaru WRX that went away, and now I have a uh, Porsche GT4. So uh, both that blue. Is, that's a pretty good. Both blue. It's a good day at the office, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's gonna be nice. a. It's going to be a, a, f- a fun week with uh, with that one. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, and then later on in the show, we'll have an interview with the uh, definitely the Acura enthusiast who has bought your 2006 TSX. It's a good interview. We're going to put that at the end so you guys can listen to the whole thing. Uh, interesting backstory there. Uh, you want to give like the, the dime tour real quick so people know what to stick around for? Sure. So I sold my car 16 years ago. And just like any time any of us sell a car, I never heard from it again until Christmas Eve of last year. And then you'll hear the rest of the story later on in the show. All right. I like it. I like it. Sounds good. We do have an update on spending uh, other people's money. Uh, This comes from Jacob at episode 734. So we'll get that in there. Then we'll talk about some of the different features that we've had on the site uh, what would you drive back in 85 and what truck would you get for 50 grand? Those are a couple that we've been doing. We hope you guys enjoy the series. They're a lot of fun to talk about, a lot of, a lot of fun to write about. So uh, with that, let's transition to the trail sport. And it sounds like there's an e-bike involved in here. So oh, do yeah. tell. This sounds like a vacation maybe or something. It was a vacation, but it was a multifaceted Good. review uh, product as well uh, built into it. So, you know, a lot of these big family vehicles and actually just SUVs in general have these what I would call outdoor adventuring trim levels. Honda has Trail Sport. Uh, Kia has X-Line and X-Pro. Um, ooh, Toyota has, I mean, they of course have their TRD, oh, TRD Off-Road, which would be like what the, um, what the Toyota RAV4 has. Like they all have these kind of uh, the off-road adventure trim levels, usually with like uh, macho tires on them and varying degrees of actual added capability. Well, so one of the newest ones is the Honda Pilot Trail Sport. And it has, it actually does have a little more capability than the normal Pilot. It isn't just some black trim on it like you get with like the Hyundai Palisade. Um, it does have those all-terrain tires on it. So I decided to take a outdoor adventure family vacation with this thing. That included, I got a, um, I got a electric bike from Royal Dutch Gazelle. This is not like a mountain bike. This is more like a, kind of like a commuter bike, really. Um, but, you know, its tires are appropriate enough to, you know, to handle some, some mild, you know, like, like dirt trail kind of thing if I had to. Um, but it was, I could put my son's uh, bike carrier onto it and just use it. I was going to Bend, Oregon, which is very much a bike capital uh, of Oregon, which itself is a bike capital of the country. Um, very cool spot. And it's a very big outdoor adventure place to go. And then for the bike, because it weighs 55 pounds, you cannot put an electric bike on any old bike rack. They are not designed for it. I even talked to Yakima about this and they said like, yeah, if you're, let's say that you have a bike rack that is rated for 100 pounds. It actually does matter that it is, you know, say each bike needs to be 50. You cannot just go, well, the bike weighs 60. That's less what... It doesn't actually work like that. There's actually components, uh, like individual component strength. So you do need something that's special for that. And so for that, I got a stage two 
it's called a stage two in that it's a stage and then there's two slots for two e-bikes. It's a much thicker, stronger, heavier piece that goes into your trailer hitch, which the Pilot Trail Sport comes standard with. So it all came together. These are the elements I went um, on the outdoor family vacation with. The Pilot Trail Sport also has raised roof rails as opposed to the flush ones that you need to get, you know, specially fitted clamps to. And they're, they're not that great. Or even worse is ones that are just like screws on the side of kind of fake rails. No, these are real ones. And I could put my, again, Yakima. I lived 15 minutes away from the Yakima headquarters before. So I'm kind of a Yakima guy. Um, but the, the Yakima, um, uh, roof rails onto it. I had it with me. I was ready to put a kayak on 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 the trail sport and have one hell of a great uh, outdoor family adventure photo with everything. Uh, but as it turns out, the road to the lake and all lakes in in Bend, outside Bend, were still closed due to snow. Uh, it was going to be opening two days after I left, and uh, only like a week and a half earlier, there was still five feet of snow on the side of the road. Uh, in points because this is like your Mount Bachelor is over um, like it is approaching like 9,000 feet up there so uh, you know uh, that, that that part was cut short I didn't get the full outdoor family adventure um, but I will say that that pilot is great for it it really is you know the, the added elements of trail sport the the hitch the the roof rack like that that stuff really did came come into its own because I was able to, you know, utilize it with gear. But the regular, but the pilot by itself, there's a lot of elements that really make a difference. First, interior storage. The old one was kind of like this and the new one is great. Like the cup holders like work for tons of large bottles. It's fantastic. Lots of, um, you know, the, the big flat surface in the front where your phone can be or you can you can just plug it in elsewhere and you can just use it for sunglasses or the sandwich you just bought while you're like you're still driving and you know the the big the big bins the um in terms of storage in the trunk so the pilot the big news for the pilot the new pilot was that um most versions have um, a middle seat in the second row that folds up and rem comes out of the car. Okay, that itself is rare, or actually that's the only mid-size three-row SUV that has this. It's something that's been in the Honda Odyssey for at least a generation now. But now they've got it small enough so it can go into the Pilot. The Acura NBX has the same thing, by the way. So the, the, but the Pilot is special because that seat can fit in the pilot, in behind uh, the lowered, in behind the third row seat. So there's a, you know, a lot of these three row SUVs have a compartment back there, storage underneath. This one is so big, it can fit that seat. Pretty cool. Um, the, the only trim level that doesn't have it, however, or at least the one that it cannot have it, is the Trail Sport. That's because the all-terrain tires are too thick that it actually raises that under floor enough that the seat no longer fits. Therefore, the Trail Sport does not have that middle seat. Nevertheless, that space underneath is still there. It's not as big, it's still really big. I was able to fit two Coleman camp chairs completely under the seat line. So I could put two and, and still have leftover room for actually a smaller camp chair. So three camp chairs back there all the time. I could put the car seat or I could put a stroller on it. I could put a little bike on top of them. So they just stayed there for when we needed them. But the rest of the cargo area was completely open, which meant that I could still raise the part of the third row. My parents were visiting us up there. So like the third row was up and down at points while we still maintained space. Um, really like that amount of versatility is, is fantastic. Um, about a month earlier, I had the Kia Telluride, also with the its X Pro Outdoor Adventure mm -hmm. trim level. 
Honestly, I don't, you, you don't gain as much with that. You, in fact, you lose something. You, you, that thing does have the all-terrain tires, but the ride was notably hampered compared to what it is in the trail sport. There is some degradation. I haven't driven the regular pilot, but you can, it's pretty obvious what it is. Um, it, it is not as big of a loss as you get with the Telluride. And just, the amount of like really great functionality that the pilot has, I'd have a hard time not picking the pilot now instead because I think it looks good too. I mean, the, the, I had the the, um, the kind of Robin. I don't know the the exact name. It's a, kind of a silly name, but this kind of Robin egg, Robin's egg blue color. Mm. I had so many people uh, coming up and like complimenting me on the color. Like, I've never seen anything like that before. I mean, this is kind of a, it could be a boring family vehicle, and it does not look like that. Um, so I think Honda did a really good job. It was a great, it was a good um, demonstration of the car. And, you know, I was I was happy to, to, to have it with me. Because it was like, you know, I think we, a lot of people drive around their three-row family crossovers with one or two kids and don't really take much advantage of it. And we're all guilty of it. Um, but in this case, like fully used it, absolutely every element of it, and it it passed big time. Um, really good. I if there's one negative, I think it could probably use a bit more power if you're routinely driving around strata volcanoes uh, like Mount Shasta in order to get to uh, get up to bend. It didn't. I, I needed to put it into sport mode just to you know, have make sure that the, the transmission was in the right gear, not necessarily because I wanted to drive sporty. Um, that's really my only only qualm with it. Good car. Sounds like you like the pilot a little bit. Yeah. The uh, I haven't driven the uh, the off-road version. I did drive the, this is a mouthful, the Telluride SX Prestige X-Pro V6 all-wheel drive mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago. And I had kind of a similar impression with you where I was like, you do get some things, but you do, there are some trade-offs. And I, I haven't driven the pilot as outfitted as you have. Uh, but generally speaking, I do like the pilot. And I think they've, like Honda specifically has done a nice job of upgrading the design, making it more contemporary. It really, it's across their SUV lineup. But, um, you know, based on what you're saying, I think I would probably lean towards the pilot versus the Telluride in this trim specifically, you know, mm -hmm. my sort of takeaway on the Telluride, as much as I really like it, was this isn't really necessary. I'm not really getting, it was more like the Telluride was kind of like wearing an off-roader sort of outfit versus actually giving you something tangible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's, there's a lot of choices in that space now. Yeah. I, I can see that Robin's egg blue you talk about too. It's in the press photos. That is a nice, nice color. It's cool. I mean, I, I do wonder like if this thing was just gray, would it be as, but I, because mm -hmm. it looked good and it has like that, that, that gloss black trim, which actually matched the, uh, the, the bike rack that was on the thing and, oh, and, nice. and the bike was complimentary too. Um, had I, had I had my usual bike, which is a, bright green thing. It just would have clashed and it would not have been yeah. as, as fashionable. So, but that, that story's coming soon and it'll be like lots of the photos of all, all the elements in question. My bike, my bike um, review is coming actually first of all of the elements. So. Um, I was going to say, I, I can't tell if you lived in Eddie Bauer or Patagonia ad or you starred <laughs> in the press photos. I mean, that's kind of how it sounds. Well, you know, like if you're going to advertise all these things, right? Like let's yeah. let's actually see what it, they're actually good for if if you can actually actually do it. Okay. So I guess by th by that thought process for the Alfa Romeo Giulia Lusso, you must have what? Sipped a nice digestif after driving this thing along rustic Tuscan roads or something. Or at least went down to Napa. I don't know. What did you do with that thing? The well, pictures I, look pretty great. I live in Southern California, so it can look like anywhere here. So it's sure. Yeah, I, sure. I, I absolutely. I drove it in uh, in Italy. Um, no, the, the, this is my first real time with a Giulia. I briefly, actually, I briefly did drive it in Southern Italy, uh, which sounds more glamorous than it is. Because Southern, like the, the heel of Italy is uh, the very flat. So it was not like that dynamic of a 
It's, it's not the most romantic area of Italy. Lovely, lovely, but you know, not anyway. Uh, and then I very briefly drove the Quadrifoglio on a very wet track in Michigan. So this was my first like, like really like, uh, extensive, um, thing with the Julia. I didn't really think of much about it, uh, beforehand. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful car. It's been out for quite a while at this point. And the Lusso trim is the middle one. So this is, Everything above the Lusso are the sport trim, the Veloce, the Estrema, and the Quadrifoglio. And so the Lusso, so it does not have uh, the sport seats. It does not have those big, chunky, beautiful shift paddles. Um, but then the rest of the car is still totally sporty. Um, the steering is magnificent. The, the handling, ditto. The ride is, I would say, well damped, but it's like, no, we're sporty. If you didn't like this, like a firm ride like this, um, you should have bought something else. So it's like, it's, it's, it's this weird car because on the one hand, it's unapologetically sporty. It's like, this is what the car is. And then they're like, well, we're going to shortchange you in sportiness by give you the seats that'll have you sliding around and not have these big flappy paddles. And by the way, we'll very obviously leave a gap, a noticeable larger than normal gap between the the uh, the, the turn signal stocks and the wheel, which is, it's, it's weird. Um, so it, it, it seemed like every alpha should just have those two elements. It was, it was kind of irritating um, and disappointing. It, I, again, it seems like you're shortchanging them because otherwise the rest of the car is fantastic that I had. Speaking of colors, Alfa Rosso, it's a, mm. it is, oh my goodness. It is sexy and it is, but it's also, it's like red yet classy. And part of mm. it, it's because it's an Alfa Romeo and it just goes together like Alfa Romeo red. Like it mm. is, the interior was tan. Those sportier trim levels, you cannot get tan in it. I'm not a big tan interior, but in this car, it, it really did. It looked good. This was just a very, it's a sporty, it's classy. Like what you, what you let off with, like that, that image of like having an espresso while sitting in a cafe next to your hot Italian car. That's what this is. I very much like this car. It was, I, I was impressed. You know, the, I had no problem with, you know, the, the, the things against Alfa Romeo, you know, like, uh, all the all the buttons and everything were beautifully made. Everything's like of of a high quality. Everything worked. Uh, the infotainment system, fine, um, fine. It's easier to. It's a touchscreen with a knob, so the redundant controls you can do either. If you only use Apple CarPlay, fine, no complaints. If you use the radio like I do. No complaints. I, as opposed to like the newfangled BMW system that I want to like take a hammer to every time I get to because it's annoyed me so much or Mercedes that just overwhelms you with the amount of things you can do. Just, yeah, it looks pretty, but is it really functional? No, I, I had no, pro the, the ADAS stuff worked really well. It's from Bosch. Um, so yeah. I, I was really impressed with, I, I liked it far more than I expected. And honestly, if I wanted to spend that much, I, there's no way I would buy this. Um, I would get like an Audi A4 instead of this. I wouldn't get a BMW 3 Series. I, I you know, Genesis G70, nope. I, I, if I wanted a sports sedan today, um, I would, with acknowledging that it, if it had a manual, I'd be head or I would go out and buy one right now. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I was really surprised at just how, uh, fun it was, how characterful it was, and actually how well executed it was. I wasn't expecting that latter bit. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I'm actually surprised you like the infotainment because most people get into it and say, well, they really should have just used the Uconnect from the rest of the Stellantis portfolio. But um, hey, I mean, you're, you're a discerning critic, so, um, you know, it must have some merits, if you will. I've heard people have issues with the latest Uconnect. Like yeah. there, there, there are some hiccups with it that weren't there in the previous one. So, I mean, Uconnect 
even let's let's just say that's not the case. You can X find, but so is this. I have no problem with this. I like when there's like the the redundancy. The no, I mean, yeah, yeah. Does it look dated? Sure, but I'm most interested in does it work. I honestly, I don't care. So, you know, um, I, I could you could live with it for a while and yeah. yeah. So I, I'm big fan of the car. Yeah, I honestly, this is on a list of things that I would really enjoy having show up in my driveway this summer. It's that time of year. The the paint is gorgeous. Alpha does a great job of getting the design details right on things like this. You know, like look at the wheels. I mean, the grill. It's like all the things they sort of said they were going to do when they were coming back to like the U.S. market. They actually delivered, I think, 115% on the design side of it, you know, especially for this car. So they do a good job of just translating that 113 years of Alpha history into a sports sedan that you could just buy, you know. And to your point, it's an it's an Italian car. It's red. I mean, they're 37 years older than Ferrari. Like they can still pull it off without faking it, mm -hmm. you know. Where sometimes I feel like I get in luxury and sporting luxury of all stripes, and you're like, oh man, this car just you know, feels a little bit like it's like they're faking it, you know, whereas Alpha really doesn't have to. I think the Stelvio might be a bit of a different setup uh, as far as just the, consume, the, the market they're going for. And, you know, it just it's a crossover. They, they have yeah. less to work with in that segment. But no, I, I agree with you. Um, can't wait to drive this thing. Speaking of BMW infotainment, I drove the 760, which... Oh my gosh. My son, I think, served, like summed it up perfectly yesterday. We were going to pick up a pizza and he said something to the effect of, dad, this car just does too much stuff. And he's five. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, you know, first of all, it's the 760. So it's, you know, the twin turbo V8. It's the flagship. It, you know, BMW decided to use the same design language as with the, the 7 series is with like the i7 electric. So you you sort of split it, if you will. Like both look, the electric car looks a little more mundane perhaps than it could, but the regular car looks, the gas powered car, does have more of a futuristic look than you might expect from like the traditional seven series, especially with the grill and the headlights. Um, I mean, yeah, motor's great. The, the four wheel steering is nice, makes it pretty easy to handle. But oh my goodness, there's just so much stuff going on with the screen. Um, it's baffling. It's confusing at times. You can figure it out. And I think after a week or so of driving it, I what I would do is I would do the like the the shortcut. I would just stick it in a mode and go to like expressive mode or something, which would put up this kind of psychedelic like screens, but it would put all the shades down and give me a nice massage. And that worked out pretty good. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Let me put it that way. Mine cost 149, uh, was the suggested retail price. So not cheap. Um, did you have, and again, it's, did you have ahead. like the, the all blacked out sinister version? No, this is more of like, uh, it was gray. Okay. <laughs> so it was pretty mundane in that sense. It did have like like the grill pieces and there was that type of piano black, if that's what it actually is, trim in the front, but it was, it was fairly generic, if you will, in that sense. It had the executive package with crystal headlights. Sure. Uh, it had the, the screen, the flat screen that comes out of the roof, yeah, uh, which is wild. Um, this car needed like an Amazon subscription to really do anything with it. So my kid was just kind of watching like, like the map, if you will, or I think that's what we served up for them. Either way, it's a really big screen. Um, I don't know. In some ways, I went on the launch of the 7 Series. Uh, this was back in like 13, you know, 14, 15, somewhere in there. And it was in Monticello at the racetrack. One of, I think, the more interesting racetracks in the Northeast. 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 I can say it. And... They actually had us do some track time on there. And they were like, no, this is, we still believe this is a BMW. It's just a little bit bigger. 
I don't know, just this and the S class, they really feel like they're becoming like tech laden limousines, which is fine. Maybe that's what they've always been, but maybe I'm getting old, but I like that older seven series a little bit more than this. It was a little more fun to drive. This, there was just so much going on. It's like a light show inside. The, the trim is gorgeous. Um, but yeah, man, there's a lot going on. You've driven the seven series. No, I, I haven't. No, you I, haven't? no, okay. I just, cause I've, I've now, it's funny, I, I, you know, I go on a lot of these press events, but I drive a lot. So I do see the parking lots of other people who have driven. And that, that's been, yeah. I think somebody has driven that sinister all black uh, 7 Series um, to an event every single time. And it, it mm. is really, it stands out. I mean, yeah. you know, that that's that's part of the appeal for some folks. I, I, I don't get it. Um, the, the grill thing, yes, it's enormous, mm. but then there's like just weird stuff in it. Like part of, I don't know if it's like some ADAS stuff, but the new five series, the I five, like the grills weird, but then there's just like weird geomet. It, it's weird. It just looks like there's, there's stuff that's behind it that they like didn't cover with a panel or thing. I don't, I do not get them. I've. I've talked to some other car designers um, and they also don't really get it. Uh, I had one car designer from a car company who knows some BMW designers and they said, quote, uh, they think they're God's gift to design. <laughs> like, okay. You know what's <laughs> so interesting? I'm going to write that down. <laughs> that's a good quote. It's interesting. <laughs> that has been my take on a lot of really expensive things I've driven lately. Like I... Somewhat paraphrase that in my Bentayga review. I was like, like, it's almost like they feel like that needs to be part of the price tag. It's just this design that we've invented and you, the consumer, will in, you know, embrace it because it's expensive and it doesn't look like anything else. Whereas, you know, I don't know, Alfa Romeo is not quite that expensive and it's much more timeless design, you know, and you know, I, I, it might be a lot to say BMW has lost its way with design because they're, I mean, they're going for it. And I feel like some of their cars look great and some of them are like, you know, what I, is going on here? I don't get it. I saw, I saw the new M2 the other day. I'm so, you know, if you futz enough with your kidney grill, it'll, you'll end up with a Pontiac. And mm -hmm. that the, the M2, especially in red, looks like a Pontiac. Because it looks very plasticky, which is very later Pontiac. But the design itself just reminds mm. me of like, like an early 70s GTO or something <laughs> like that. Like it, it doesn't look like a BMW. It looks like a Pontiac. So yeah, can, with all I due respect to saying. Pontiac, I, are you going for that BMW? <laughs> Half a century old Pontiac design? I don't know. Right. I mean, it's uh, right. I, it, to show you how polarizing their design is, though, I like the M2. I think it's... When I look at that, I see almost like, like it's angular, but it's also kind of like bulging. Like it reminds me almost of like some of the eighties, like launches or something. Like it really is in the eye of the beholder. You sort of see what you want to see there and you like it or you don't. Um, but then there's other, you know, BMWs where I'm like, what are they doing here? It, it really so. comes down to the face of the thing. And for like at least a decade now, the faces of their cars do are not coherent with the rest of the car. It looks like somebody's mm -hmm. in charge of the front and then there's everybody else is doing the rest, yeah. but then they just glob on the front. That I will say the seven series is a little more coherent with mm -hmm. the rest of the car as is like the X seven for that matter. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it always comes sure. back to us griping about BMW design, I suppose. I mean, BMW design, Miata. And you know what, though? Once upon a time, people were bright in the Chris Bangle era were griping about BMW design, the crazy 7 Series, the crazier 5 Series, the, the, the swoopier one. And people complained about it. They were like, no, we're doing this. And then a generation later, all of that went away. And those cars, I don't think, have aged very well. Um, yeah. So we'll see if we'll see if history repeats itself, and if yeah, everything in fifteen years looks like a Pontiac. Well, that would be the ultimate revenge for Pontiac, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. 
So speaking of things from a long time ago, let's talk about what uh, our staff would drive back in 1985. Now, you kind of came up with an interesting parameter here, uh, adjust, adjusting for inflation. Uh, this is, I don't know, I thought the, the list was pretty interesting. A lot of different things on here. Um, you know, it's very 80s. What, uh, I don't know, what do you think? You think who's, who's on the mark here? What's, uh, oh, what do you well, think here? So the key thing is, so the, the original time we did this was here's $50,000, what car would you buy? And you had to use all $50,000 you can't like spend 30 and then blow the rest of it on an ATV or something. You needed to spend mm -hmm. everything. So that was the thing. But then we wanted to see, well, how much was $50,000 back in 1985? And as it turns out, that's $18,000. Okay, well, how much car could you buy for then? And this is kind of an, an, uh, an exercise in inflation. And so 18 wasn't, so you really couldn't buy many like import luxury cars. Like even a, what did I say? A, uh, the only, and even like a, the only Cadillac you could buy was a Cimarron. So luxury cars have actually, if anything, gotten cheaper um, after all this time. The only BMW you, you could buy for $50,000, the equivalent of $15,000 was a base three series which is what John Snyder picked, by the way. But, you know, today you can buy BM multiple BMWs for less than $50,000. Not many of them, but you can, including the 3 Series. Um, you know, I, I picked, my choice was a Volvo 240 GL wagon, so the big boxy wagon thing. Uh, I figured oh, I'll go for the kind of the family vehicle I would want back then. Um, but... Volvo wasn't entirely a luxury brand then, you know, it was, it was expensive because it was, you know, better made than an old Cutlass Cruiser, but, uh, you know, it wasn't like filled with leather and like the Volvo we know of today. So that's why like that range of luxury car, like you might be able to get like into a Saab, maybe, um, just things like that. Um, but most American cars, you, you, that those are way cheaper. You would not be able to get up to 18,000 if, even if you tried to go nuts with options. So some of the cars that we chose here, I, Jeremy picked an Alfa Romeo GTV6. That's a very cool car. Beautiful car. Um, Byron chose, oh no, Zach, Zach Palmer picked a Ford Mustang SVO, which is like top of the line Mustang. So there you go. Um, I like it. Yeah. And yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting that Volvo, I could totally picture you driving that in 1985. That just seems like exactly what you would have in your garage. So, yeah, I mean, I would, I would have, well, just like now I have like a Kia Nero EV and then I also have, well, all of the cars, but then also my, my, my little sports car, it would be the same. Like you have sensible family vehicle and then something fun. I don't know yeah. what that sense of that something fun would be, but you know, in '85, yeah. what would you the pick? Mustang, Why, you didn't you didn't weigh in on this one because you know yeah, you're busy doing too busy, things, too so, busy doing expense reports and signing everybody's like travel receipts and all that stuff. That's why I unfortunately don't get to weigh in on these as much. But the Mustang, the Fox Body Mustang, I almost certainly would have picked that. I think that's that's just a car I've been kind of really liking lately. There is like you know, it's summer cruising season in Michigan, so there's no shortages of Mustangs. I like that one. Uh, I think the FJ Cruiser that Greg tossed on there is pretty creative. The Alpha is definitely a, a deep cut, that's for sure. Um, you know, going from the back of the deck there. So lots of good stuff here. That It's funny, when I was in grad school, a guy who, we had this like random old guy who lived in the like it was essentially like student housing. It wasn't student housing, but it was across the street from campus. And it was like 20 Michigan State students and one random dude. And I literally must have dinged this Volvo wagon because that's what he drove. Of course, it's a college campus. There's always the random dude driving a, Vol a Volvo wagon. I used to bump into it all the time. It was like always an accident, but I just remember it. I was like, oh God, I hit that thing again, or oh, I bumped into it. And I had a Chevy Lumina that was just 
you know, you could have rammed something with that thing and you wouldn't have even really cared. But I was always afraid this guy was going to like sue me for my student loans or whatever. But I don't know. So that's my take on those on that era of Volvo wagon. Uh, what do you think? $50,000 truck? This is definitely a little less quirky, a little more yeah. probably SEO. Well, but optimized. so here's the thing with $50,000 truck. Okay, that sounds easy enough. Yeah, good good, good luck finding a $50,000 truck. If you want to know why the average, so you hear this all, like the average new car price is $50,000. Oh my God, how is anyone ever going to afford a car? Well, the thing mm -hmm. is, it's the problem with calculating something by average. Mm -hmm. Because... Go try and buy a full-size truck with a, with a crew cab, not the base engine, and any equipment. Good luck getting that under $50,000. And when you consider the top four selling vehicles are all full-size truck, buy a gigantic country mile. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of trucks versus the next best car or SUV. That means that there's a hell of a lot of vehicles that are being sold for way more than $50,000, which completely mm -hmm. throws the idea of average out of whack. So, but what can you got buy for $50,000? And as I said, like only one of us bought an actual, chose an actual full-size truck. Mm -hmm. And Greg Rasa, but he, he picked like the regular bit, the regular cab one. And... So you can get that with lots of equipment. You can get the the extended cab with decent equipment. You can get a crew cab base engine with some with some equipment on it. But it's definitely not, which I think what most people would end up doing if they had to. But like no V8, no turbo V6. Um, so they're not that appealing. So what most of us did were we, we were most of us were playing in the midsize category. I got a GMC Canyon AT4 with that sports bar package, kind of this Marty McFly looking truck. It's cool. Mm -hmm. This is a cool looking truck. I'm a, I was excited about that one more than like the the kind of V6 powered kind of XLT Ram I was looking at. Not XLT. Um, uh, uh, Longhorn. Um, uh, Byron picked a Jeep Gladiator Willis. Very cool looking truck. Um, Zach Palmer went absolutely nuts on the Honda Configurator to buy, to somehow make a, a Ridgeline 50 grand. Uh, John Snyder also picked a color, picked the Colorado, but he picked the ZR2. Whereas I went for like the lower level, but then optioned it up with a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, Joel went nuts with a, a Nissan Frontier. I just knew he would. He loves that truck so much. Yeah. I was interested to see just how he could possibly put all the, let's see, he put sliding bed extender, bed step and handle, outdoor Bluetooth speaker, rubber floor mats, illuminated door sills, partridge, pear tree, et cetera, to get it up to 50 grand. But my favorite one, and I did not see this coming, was Jeremy, who picked a Ram 2500 Tradesman. Yeah. So... So although it's hard to buy a full-size truck, it's even harder to buy a heavy-duty, but he managed it and he got the Tradesman. I've driven a Tradesman. It's actually not that stripped out, right? It's not like mm -hmm. totally vinyl everywhere. Um, but he got it for just a little, on, just right at our, at our line. And uh, he still managed to get it, get it in orange. So that's fun. And uh, it had the eight-foot bed. So it kind of goes to show you can you can in fact buy a variety of trucks for fifty thousand dollars, but don't count on getting like one of like, you know, the really desirable V eight or big turbo V six if we're talking Ford or hybrid, or you know any of the ones that kind of are brochure fodder. Uh, don't don't count on one of those for fifty grand. Yeah, I um. I like, I probably would have leaned Gladiator myself with a second choice. I'm, this is interesting. I'm experiencing more distance than I would have thought. I would have, I generally like the Colorado better than the Canyon. I just I feel like that Chevy off road vibe really comes through. When I look at the trims, I don't think I'd do ZR2. Like, if I were really going to spend this money, I think I'd probably take your approach and take a lower trim and then just load it up with everything I could get 
you know, stop short of 50. But it's funny when I look at the design aesthetics, I almost like the Canyon more, you know, some of the different like off-roady trims uh, mm-hmm. short of the full on one. Because again, when I take the ZR2 off the table, I look down, I'm like, oh, these look a little more generic. Whereas for almost like the first time in my career, I'm looking at the Canyon thinking, oh, this is kind of the better, the more off-roady truck uh, from an aesthetic perspective, if you will. Mechanically, they're all very similar. I don't think I'd get those, you know, the back to the future rails that you're going for, but I'd probably get most of the other stuff. That, that's all. That's honestly the only reason I got the Canyon. Okay. <laughs> so you can get that. You can actually get that on the Colorado. However, um, you have to get like a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, the, the bar, yeah. you also have to get the big light thing on top of it. And then mm-hmm. together that costs 29 nine, so almost three grand to get that on the Canyon. However, on mm. the Colorado, if you want that, you have to get all this other, 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 other stuff. And it ends up like being a $59,000 truck just for the sound, just for that, that stupid bar on the back. So uh, assuming that I wanted that truck, that that was the, the thing, the key element that put it over the design top for, but I needed to get the Canyon. Otherwise I would have probably gone with the, the ZR2. But Interesting. Not that I've yeah, driven, I'm, I haven't driven that. I've driven the other, all the other Colorados. I kind of like the AT4 four wheel drive with, without the extra like, you know, wing things, if you will. I kind of like that. You could even get uh, the Denali puts you at 53. So you can't do that. That's a lot of truck if, you know, if you want that. But again, this is my like second one. I would do Gladiator. Yeah. And I also feel like I'm going to really like the new Ranger. So I'd probably slide that into second place once I, you know, drive it. Um, I always kind of like the old Ranger better than really almost anybody outside of, uh, yeah, I feel like a lot of the Autoblog alumni, people who have come and gone over the years, we had like a Ranger coalition. That's why it won our midsize test, but I don't I, know. I, like, I, I kind of like the old school vibe. I like the Ranger. I mean, it just, you know, it, it's it's a modern truck frame and underpinnings with an old truck yeah. blocked on top of it. And it's the yeah. old truck on top of it that's the... Uh, that's kind of that makes it seem more dated than the actual driving experience and every all its capability yeah. would imply. It's hard to justify, like when you're rationally trying to spend that kind of money for stuff. When you look at it and you're like, okay, well, we know the GM trucks are newer. We know mm-hmm. even the Jeep is newer, and a lot of the things that we care about are newer. So, so it goes. All right. So check these out. We have a few more of these coming up. Uh, yeah, lots of features. We have opinions. You know, we throw out our Autoblog Garage video series. We try to throw some retro stuff at you, this including. Um, yeah. I mean, Mr. Features, man, we got quite the features calendar these days. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about... Um, all right. So before we get to your feature here about selling your TSX, we have an update. This is... Spending my money, Jacob writes from episode 734. Hello, just a quick update from me. Not long after I wrote in last year, I had some major unexpected expenses come up. So I wasn't able to buy anything. I spent the last little while saving up again, improving credit, trying to buy, trying to decide again this year. Still looking for the Focus ST. I took your advice and started looking at GTIs. Honestly, I fell in love with them. I got... I, and I almost got one, except uh, it got snatched out before I had a chance to pull the trigger. I decided I would just look for both and just buy whichever one came up as a good deal first. Okay, kind of throw the dice and see what happens. My improved financial situation and car prices having slightly fallen uh, have helped. And this week, uh, Jacob ended up closing on a fully loaded and well cared for 2016 Focus ST even came in $1,200 under budget. Pretty happy with it. Just thought I'd keep you guys updated. So it's podcast at autoblog.com if you want us to spend your money or if you have an update. You know, you're one of the probably in the hundreds of people we've helped over the years at this point. Please get them in. Please give us an update. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so with that, let's talk about your sort of car uh, selling experience, a much loved 2006 Acura TSX. Tell us about it, James. Sure. So uh, right now I'm looking out my window at uh, something that has passed through a time machine. 
In my driveway is a 2006 Acura TSX in Arctic Blue. It's an electric, like deep electric blue. Um, beautiful paint job. And uh, this is the car that I owned in 2006 and 2007. Um, and it's in my driveway for the next couple of hours until I uh, will return it to its current owner. And the story is, so I ordered this car in early 2006. I ordered it. I ordered an Acura. No one really orders Acuras. But I did so because I wanted the combination of Arctic Blue. Like today, everybody wanted a gray car or white or black. And I wanted Arctic Blue. So I needed to order it. But even more so, I wanted it with a six-speed manual transmission. Because, you know, when you're listening to this podcast, you know. Um, I also wanted navigation, uh, not because I needed navigation, but because it actually increased the audio system functionality for this newfangled thing that I really like called satellite radio. So it did all these things. So that's, I wanted to order this car. I got this car. And um, about a, year, a little more than a year later, and after only 5,600 miles driven, I got my dream job as an automotive journalist. I was not going to need a daily driver anymore. I was going to be driving all of the cars now. And for so this car was just going to sit in the garage. It was going to collect dust and depreciation. And you know, I, I didn't I wasn't like I, I wasn't like in love with this car. I didn't have enough time to really bond with it honestly. So I wasn't it was just going to be, it wasn't going to be collectible. You know, no one in 16 years was gonna like, you know, buy it as a collector item, sure, certainly, or like even restore it. No, that, that would be nuts. That would never happen. So I sold it to somebody who lived in Utah and he came and he picked it up. And uh, I, uh, he was very excited about the car and I never heard from the car again. Until Christmas Eve of this year when I got an Instagram message from someone named Tyson Hughey. And he had just bought my TSX from all of those years ago from the exact same person who bought it from me, who loved the car for about 185 or about 182,000 miles on it. He took tremendous care of it mechanically. The interior looked tremendous, but the Utah sun had done a number on not very good Honda paint. So Tyson did what he does, um, and he restored it. Why would anybody do this? How would he do this? Well, I will now let him tell the story in this interview I did with him while sitting in the TSX uh, while we both just happened to be attending the Acura Integra Type S launch. Long story short, I'm gonna summarize it. I'm an Acura brand aficionado. They call me an Acura addict. I've been a fan of Honda and Acura products since the late 90s. I got my driver license and promptly sought out an 89 Prelude. So whenever I come across or learn of a particularly rare model, it kind of stays with me for a long time. So fast forward roughly to 2011, Acura threw a big red carpet party for me when I rolled half a million miles in a legend. I then sort of started collecting cars and my, my brother had a classmate who was a friend of mine from Southern Utah, a year younger than I was. And I knew as of about 2013 that he had a blue 2006 TSX six speed manual. And that car always sort of was one that I had on my checklist, just in the back of my mind, like how cool is that color? Cause you just never see him anyway. He and I met up in 2013 in his driveway in Cedar City, Utah. I was driving my red 92 NSX back from Salt Lake to Phoenix where I live. And I stopped at his house. He had a black Integra GSR, this TSX, and there was my red NSX in his driveway for a photo shoot. This car still looked pretty darn nice. I mean, it was only what, um, seven years old at the time, but the following decade or so wasn't as friendly to it. Um, my friend ended up replacing the car with an EV a few years ago. Um, the TSX was 
relegated to side parking at his house and the sun in southern Utah was not friendly to it. This, this paint got absolutely destroyed. Um, I don't think the car was actively exercised as much. So obviously that also contributes to some, you know, deterioration. So I was kind of after chance, my friend, to, to just let me give this car a good home. You know, I know you're sentimentally attached to it, but I'll fix it up and I'll, you know, do it, do it justice because I know how rare it was. So finally pried the car out of his hands in December of last year. And um, we agreed on a price that was maybe a little bit too much for a car that needed a full restoration. But, <laughs> but I also recognized how special the car was. It made the 400 mile trip from Utah to Phoenix flawlessly. And I kind of started doing things just via prioritization after that. So obviously I wanted the mechanical bits to be reliable before I spent a dime on paint. So tires, brakes, fluids, those were some of the first things that we looked at. Um, beyond that, I started just saving up, you know, a few pennies here and there to do uh, the exterior body work. So I have a great shop in Phoenix that worked on the car for about maybe two, two and a half months. And we kept it the original Arctic blue. I sourced an uber rare Accord Euro R um, body kit, which is really kind of subtle, but it's definitely upgraded. So other than that, the car is 100% as, it, as James drove it off the showroom floor, uh, 2006. So 189,000 miles I rolled yesterday. I drove it out from Phoenix for the Acura Integra, Integra Type S um, press event. And uh, it's the second longest trip I've ever taken in the car and it didn't skip a beat. So, you know, I think this car has easy another 200K left in it. <laughs> it might not have great infotainment or, you know, rocket like <laughs> acceleration, but this K24, you know, J Japanese built platform with the manual is, is one of Honda's most crowning achievements. I mean, if they could sell this car as the Accord in Europe, which they did, you know, they had a lot of faith in it because that's, that nameplate carries so much weight. So that's kind of yeah. it. <laughs> this was, this was a car and driver 10 best. Yeah. When it came out though, that was a reason why. Yeah. I, I got it at the time. Um, but um, so tell me about some of the other cars so that because obviously like um, like restoring a 2006 Acura TS TLX is not something that <laughs> yeah. well, or even just like just generally cars from that era yeah. you would do. So like what are some of have you have you sure. restored other cars? What are they? Um, it, it's, it's funny yeah. you ask because there was a story ab about me a few years ago that says this guy's car fetish is so weird it's actually nor or no his fetish is so normal it's actually weird or something to that effect yeah. like aka i like to restore and preserve cars that most people wouldn't bat an eye at so i love my nsx but not not everybody cares enough about an 06 tsx to spend twice what you spent on the car on paintwork like that is just financially stupid <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i'll never see another one of these in arctic blue six speed with the man with the navigation system i mean i knew full well this car was a rare spec to begin with and i think there's always sort of some heartstrings being tugged at that this car deserved better than to eventually just end up on craigslist sold to some college kid who would run it into the ground you know and just to give you the scope, I also have a 2002 RSX that's currently getting the same treatment, a Type S. I got it from my neighbor, Susan, who's 75. Um, she beat up every corner of the exterior, so that's getting an overhaul. But yeah, that's kind of the name of the game. Um, last year, I restored a 95 Legend Coupe that was um, dilapidated and sitting in a driveway for three years, and now it's, it's a showpiece. So, every car I kind of take through this process, the crowning achievement for me is when it can sit on the showroom, the literal showroom floor. So I have a good relationship with the general manager at Acura of Tempe, Arizona, uh, Todd, and he lets me, I go open the doors for myself. I know where my keys in his drawer and I swap, I literally Sunday morning, I pick this car up out of the showroom floor 
took it home and drove it here to California the next day. So it had sat on the showroom floor for four weeks. And uh, the funny part is now that I've had this rotating display at the dealer for so long, they made me start putting a not for sale picture on the <laughs> dash because all these cars yeah. evoke so much nostalgia and everybody who's bringing in an MDX or a TLX or whatever for service, they'll look at this car and be like, oh my gosh, like I had a first gen TSX and and the car is just kind of special that way. You know, it has, they sold so many of them that it was, it was something that is relatable for a lot of people. So, yeah. so you I believe I, I saw a photo of it. Do you, I know you've had it, but do you still have a like aquamarine Acura Vigor? Oh, that one's gone. Oh. But it was Arcadia Green. Yeah, so that that was a cool car. Five cylinder, five speed manual. I'm oh. a manual snob. That was a rare spec. Um, pretty clean car already when I got it, and I sold it on Bring a Trailer to a collector in. Seattle area who still drives it and talks about it. So my thing is, you know, I can't keep them all. This this is kind of catch and release for me. So I can at least take pride in knowing that I might have saved this car from, you know, a worse life. Yeah. And um, I enjoy it. I have fun with it. And then sometimes I keep them. Sometimes I let them go. The Vigor was one. I kept it for five years. Love that car. Um, the challenge on that one that I don't have with the TSX bigger parts are just yeah, unobtaining. No. Yeah, like you need a clutch slave cylinder for a Vigor, you're gonna fabricate well, one. Unlike so, the, this is a European Accord, the Vigor yeah. was a bonkers wackadoo yeah. car. Like yeah. like look it up, it, it, like yeah. a one five cylinder, but then there is, what's going through the whole cylinder block uh, on it was, that? It, 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 it's, it was it's longitudinally the, mounted. Yeah, G25 it's a longitudinally mounted Honda engine. What? wheel drive. It was the weirdest car ever. It had make great noises. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, yeah. My father owned one. Yeah. He had one. They largely got it because it had heated seats and we were Canadian and it was, that was like whiz hey, bang amazing things. Deal. And yeah. it was a nice car. Yeah. But it, that was an important bigger. car too because it bridged a gap because if you, you have to remember Acura's early days was Integra, legend nsx they needed something yeah. to fill that price point so the vigor and if you watch some of the promotional videos they literally say but in between four cylinders and six is five, five yeah. that's where we did it so well it yeah. the vigor became the tl Bigger, so really mm -hmm. the vigor is the original Acura TL and that's tlx a, that's a good point yeah because it was the it slotted right there and you raise a good point a lot of people mistakenly think um, legend became TL, but the legend was the flagship yeah. late, later became RL, oh. RLX, and now is defunct as of a couple years ago. Yeah. So, um, so really if any, but well, that, well, we are both here to drive the Integra type S. I don't think I, I, I'm, should we just start like lobbying for them to rename the TLX the Vigor? <laughs> the bigger. Because I, I had, they should do How that. How funny would that, that be? That would be great. Yeah, and they've renamed the RDX the Legend, whatever. Yeah. The ZDX, the ZDX, the they're bringing ZDX that crazy is thing back. back. Yeah, Call so. that thing the Legend. <laughs> no, um, don't do that. <laughs> no. Yeah, but it is fun. And, you know, this event, uh, I was talking to Jonathan Rivers from the Acura uh, product planning team, and the cool thing about bringing the name back is that they're seeing 70% of the people who bought an Integra in the last year since it went on sale have come from other brands. So mm -hmm. what I would like to know is, are these people leave, have they left the brand and they're coming back? Or are they just conquests as you call it, like from another luxury automaker or, or what have you? It'd be a very interesting to see the analysis I, there. I would not be surprised so. if it's people coming back because after this car, so I, I I owned with this car, I loved it. But when the next one came out, I I was then like reviewing cars and that the, the second generation TSX was a big drop off. There, it, it didn't yeah. look as good. Uh, the steering, especially it was they switched to eps and it was not good at all yeah uh just the entire car was just softer it was bigger it was less enjoyable to drive it was available in a wagon you could get yeah, that one here i think TSX you could sport wagon there was a this this <laughs> car actually there was a wagon version we didn't get it. right good but, point uh, besides that it yeah. just wasn't as 
interesting. Yeah, e even with some of the Acura team last night, we, we kind of lovingly refer to that 2009 to 12, 13 era as some dark ages. You know, the design language was polarizing. Uh, there wasn't a lot, you know, of performance driven uh, effort. And so, and then the same could be said about the TL, right? So oh, the a, third gen TL, so. 04 to 08 TL is just an iconic car, mm -hmm. even today, the Type S, you know, and then in 09, things kind of went a little sideways in the same way. More more like um, a drop, <laughs> drop. If you look at look at the, the, the TL was like the best selling luxury car. Mm. Like that, that, oh, and then its predecessor was also like the best selling mm. luxury car. And then the Robo Beak came out and it plummeted. Yeah. It just went into the ground and not coincidentally, Acura kind of did too. It, it took yeah, a it long was, time. It was a detour for sure. And, and I'd actually, I have to give a teeny bit of credit. I drove my friend Brian's 2012 TL all wheel drive manual six speed. It's a super capable and fun car, but people just couldn't get looked past how it looked. Yeah. And so there were prices to pay, you know, and Acura, I think now they have a completely new leadership team as of within the last few years, John and Kata actually came from a design background. So it was a really unique fit for a design guy to be promoted to senior leadership. Mm -hmm. And honestly, based on what we're seeing the brand roll out right now, it's a pretty solid move. I mean, he. He's launched, you know, now NSX Type S, MDX Type S, TLX Type All this stuff is performance oriented. They're back, you know, big time into racing efforts. And so, you know, we'll see what the future holds. It's it's tough to be, and this question was pitched to John in a podcast um, with Johnny Lieberman the other day. As a performance brand, how do you embrace electrification? Because isn't electrification largely about autonomy? and not being driving your own car. Mm -hmm. So they have their work cut out for them in the next few years to you know, embrace what Acura is called precision crafted performance and still stay on the cutting edge of new product development. So, so, so here's a question. So the car that we are driving, not the Type S, but the regular Integra, is that car the way it is, does it in fact have more in common spiritually with this car? Than the original, than than the last car called Integra, kind of. I I kind of think it does. <laughs> I really do. Um, and if you look at kind of the succession, I mean, this was the entry level sedan to the lineup. That mm -hmm. car is the entry. I mean, yeah. It, on paper, it is the Integra, mm -hmm. right? They're so, similar, and yeah. I mean, this is similar. I mean, they're they're. I guarantee well, it, the, the Civic yeah. of or the, the Civic based Integra today is bigger than this car. I would mean, definitely yeah. bigger back seat. It, you have to consider too, I mean, if this was a, an Accord in Europe, but European cars traditionally are smaller. It was way smaller. <laughs> so, so if you look at it and through that lens, but I, I totally agree with you. I think this car paired up with, you know, the Integra of today they they're catering to the same market mm -hmm. you know yeah. you're looking for someone who's it's a gateway car to the brand if you're lucky they come in they love this car they love the integra they move up to the tlx to whatever beyond that so you know and this car i think achieved that for a lot of people i mean you were i think you said in your early 20s when you bought it so maybe not yet a family man you know wanted something fun to drive didn't need a minivan yet or whatever i mean mm -hmm. what compelled you to order this you know at that time in your life uh well uh two things one i was working for uh acura of santa monica so it was very i was selling these things mm -hmm. and uh i, I enjoyed it I, I liked it as i said uh, i was not reviewing cars at the time so I, well, I guess I was sort of, but not, 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 not well yeah. or for anybody important. And then, um, it's like car and driver 10 best. It was like a big car. It was fun to drive. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I was and continue to be a spoiled only child. And so for this and that, my parents said, well, we're worried about the car that you have, uh, dying and costing you more money. Yeah. So we're going to, um, we're going to help you buy this one. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to say no to that. Um, so the, I got the car. Um, 
and uh, I enjoyed it, but I only drove it for like 55, uh, 5,500 miles or so um, because I then got my dream job at Edmonds and I was then going to be driving all of the cars. Right. Um, So it just was sitting in the Edmonds parking garage, gathering dust and depreciation. (laughs) And on, and again, I didn't have it. I didn't like, like I wasn't like in love with the car. Right. I didn't really have sentimental value. Right. It was, you know, an accurate TSX. Like right. this is not going to be like a bridge. Right. It's not going right. to be a, who no one is ever going to get this car and restore it. Uh, for instance, someday <laughs> that's never going to happen. Right. <laughs> so, think? yeah. So I sold it. Yeah. And chance chance bought it. So the person you bought it from is the person I sold so it to. So it's only a three owner car, which is also kind yeah. of weird, especially because his was the longest duration. Because like you said, yours was short lived. I think yeah. the record showed literally one oil change under you. Oh, I had like 5,600 miles <laughs> yeah, or and something. Then it, and and but, then, yeah. So I, so I ordered this car um, one, because I kn- knew you could, uh, like who orders an Acura, right? Like the number of builds possible yeah. is tiny. But the number of builds that a dealer is going to order Mm -hmm. is even tinier than that. It's mostly just like gray. This is kind of the same. This was like 2006, but dealers were really just buying gray and white and black. Totally common colors, yeah. And then, so I wanted Arctic blue. I actually went back and forth between Arctic blue and the lighter blue, Mm. but this was was ultimately cooler, but then like manual. Yeah. Good luck finding a yeah, manual never. that a dealer's <laughs> ordering. Yeah. So I I ordered it. And I ordered it and I waited like three to four months for the car. And so I had Arctic Blue and then the navigation system. We were talking about yeah. earlier. This has the navigation system. Honestly, I didn't care as much about the navigation system as I did with the better audio mm. interface. So um Specifically, specifically because of satellite radio and specific, and here um, it has the six radio presets on the bottom, and then it shows you the name of what your of the so- basically what satellite radio is. Yeah, and this was like a big thing in in the year two thousand six. Yeah, um, so that was why I wanted the the the, navi- the the navigation system with the big touchscreen. Honestly, this is a big touchscreen. It is for the. For I, its I, time. I, it just dawned on me that this <laughs> is actually, kind of an enormous. Is touchscreen for the era yeah. like this is it's probably about seven uh, it's inches between, or something yeah. and it's which is like kind of what which is what the base accord right. touchscreen is today right yeah i mean in its day and this same interface i'm not if i'm not mistaken i think was also carried into the third gen tl which would make sense it was yeah. the same era it was everything um, the, the, the buttons were a little different mm-hmm. along the bottom but I think, and I've never used this old joystick thing, but it's that's just to scan around the map. Yeah, because they didn't have swiping, right, and pinching and all yeah, that. But this yeah. has a so it has a premium sound system. This is before Elliot Shiner. Um, mm-hmm. It has a six 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 disc CD changer in dash. Right? In dash. <laughs> um, it has an aux jack which um, was like huge because you could plug in your iPod. Should we show the book? <laughs> yeah, and to this very day, like I, I had to remember that I was driving a car from 06, so I needed to like bring my little adapter that I have from my Z3, the car that replaced this. Um, so I'll be able to listen to my my phone or what have you. There's, and, your, there's your voice control. Right, so this is voice <laughs> controls. So you can actually program the navigation system relatively very easy. Um, you just have to, you just have to press the button. There's no like, hey, Acura business right. back then. Concierge. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you have this little book here, and then you go with your voice control, and you just have to memorize um, what the what, what the commands right. are. So you have to be like, I'm not going to go through this because if I narf it, it's not going to be great. <laughs> but it's basically like you click like destination, and then you can say like, um, Ohio Valley. Yeah. Ohio Valley. Yeah, yeah. Ohio, California. Uh, oh, hey, well, no, you can't say there's no search. You uh, will need the address. You actually need the numbers. I believe yeah. you do. Um, so. so like you could just like, okay, so like District of Columbia, Washington, 
1600 Pennsylvania, or it might even have to do like Pennsylvania Avenue, mm-hmm. 1600. But it's like, it makes sense once you know it. Yeah. And this was like way good because everything else was garbage for like years. Um, so like, it, it, it was a pretty good, uh, yeah. it's actually subsequent ones were worse. Well, like the, the last, the last, uh, the Civic touchscreen wasn't good. I don't use it at any all. Of that. I'm on it my was phone like easier all the time, to use. So. Uh, the, the graphics are like Nintendo. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but otherwise, it's a really, really some cool materials in here. I love the the volume control has yeah. this kind of like record, mm-hmm. um, like etching in it. And then the the uh, the shift knob has the real metal shifter on. It. And if you look at what's in the Type S. I think it's, it's it's got a wrap around it just like this, but it's a little different. It's, uh, but it's like of the same the uh, yeah. idea, and yeah. it's it's real metal. And I and if you I it gets hot, mm-hmm. like really hot, yeah. and really cold. I used to bring I had a baseball a baseball batter's glove just to have in the car, so I yeah. wouldn't have uh, the the shift. Uh, pattern etched in my hand like uh, branded Mar- branded in my, like Marv <laughs> yeah. from Home Alone. Yeah, um, forehead. Yeah. And the funny thing about speaking of the XM, so the brain for this is actually, I believe, DVD driven. It's in the trunk. Yeah. Um, underneath the rear speakers. So I, I haven't touched it. Somehow it is still working here. But where did I get to my nav map guide? So I mean, like you said, in its day, this was probably pretty cutting edge. But by today's standards, you know, it's pretty. Well, of course. The, the nice thing, though, it's not so bad. Like some of these things, like a BMW navigation system mm-hmm. from the, like you don't want that because it like hampers the functionality of everything else. Mm-hmm. But since I bought this for the functionality of everything else, it's kind of uh, it's kind of. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, this. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm eager to to drive. Yeah, it actually. Have, I, mean, I hope you have some fun with it. Rev the hell out of it. It's mm-hmm. it's got almost two hundred thousand miles, but you wouldn't know it on the road. Um, Rev line goes to seven thousand RPM. Seven K. And and I gotta be t- I gotta be perfectly honest. One of the other reason why I wasn't too sad, but I didn't like driving it all that much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't like driving all much. Um, it, this was the car that I realized how much I like torque because mm. I was coming from a VR6 Volkswagen mm-hmm. and I, I didn't realize that I like torque yeah. as much in the high strung engine, high strung engine. Uh, I don't think I, yeah, I kind of realized one, it wasn't for me. Also, it was a little difficult to drive smoothly. Mm. I, I, can, I can agree with that. Um, I had the clutch replaced for some of those same reasons. I felt like, and I'm a great manual driver, but I just felt like something was a little bit off. So it's improved, but you'll have to let me know what you think. It's the flywheel or something. Yeah. But what was worse was the TL. Mm. The TL of that era was very difficult to drive smoothly. I think it's a torque steer issue combined with a lot of things. Not even but, that. No, I'm, I mean like mundane. Oh, yeah. Like clutch mm-hmm. l- let up uh, stuff. But um, so, yeah. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this little uh, journey with us for his new car and my old car. Yeah. Um, this really is like a crazy thing because ha- yeah. being reunited with an old automotive friend like 16 years later yeah. is like the stuff that like they make uh, like classic car shows. Yeah, <laughs> my of. classic car. Um, so, yeah. and I didn't have to pay for it to, right. to enjoy uh, yeah. this this, uh, this Back to the Future uh, moment here. So, yeah. so th- thanks so much for uh, joining me here in, uh, for, in my car and thank you for doing this. Yeah, no, this, this, this has is been like fun. Amazing. And we, you know, this was in, in the works for a long time. Uh, and I knew that, you know, this car had some special backstory and, and what you shared about ordering it, even I don't know if, if Chance, who I bought the car from, knew that. So really cool backstory. You know, I, I saw the window sticker back here at 30 grand and it'd be interesting to know how many of these cars that you know were sold back in that area are still around um that was a that was sort of a a big deal for the brand it was a volume seller you know the car the brand was celebrating 20 year anniversary mm-hmm. so there was a lot there was a lot on the line and uh the fact that this still is a reliable daily driver you know this many years later speaks to how well it was engineered and 
you know, some people would argue they might even rather have this than a brand new car because it was a fraction of the price. And if it ain't broke, you know, why replace it? So, I mean, especially when no someone's going to restore it because yeah. it like <laughs> it does look like a brand new so, car. And yeah, even, you know, honestly, tired. the interior is like, yeah, the interior is not as like the, the, the driver's seat isn't as tight as it used to be. But there's only a little bit of wear. There's a wear on the bolster there. But, I mean, the perf I'm surprised the perforated leather held up because these are notorious for getting frayed. Just leather in general. Yeah. It's a yeah. reason not to buy leather in a car right. you're going to hold on for a while. Yeah. But like the material, Chance did like, a, you know, was, I, I often say like the exterior, like the exterior paint on this was rough. Mm -hmm. um, but that's often like you can tell like how you look inside a car, mm -hmm. like to see how nice someone, because you can see a car and the like, paint looks bad and looks right. kind of like worn but it's clean and then you look inside and it's meticulous and you're like that person cares about their yeah, car it doesn't matter they may they just not have a lot. garage so or they don't have too. a lot of money to buy the nicest car but they're right. caring for it you right. always like applaud that person yeah agreed and that was the the whole point was because he plenty of times could have could have let the car go for you know a college kid to drive to school or whatever but he intentionally held out uh, wanted it to go to a good home. So here we are, you know, I, I don't know if it's a long-term car for me, if anybody out there particularly is in love with an 06 blue TSX, talk to me. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I like that, you know, this car could have a happy ending in this sort of way. And uh, what better place to, to show it to James than next to brand new blue 2024 Integra Type S cars. The, the, the stars couldn't have aligned better for that. Absolutely. So, They're yeah. even like similar colors. Yeah, so. they are too close. All right, well, thank yeah. you so much for this. Yep. And uh, yeah, so this was, uh, this was my car and uh, now it's his car. All right, have fun with it. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. That is a very interesting backstory. Um, Definitely, uh, please get in the comments. Let us know if you have any sort of long lost cars that maybe came back to you sort of uh, in ghostly fashion. Uh, James, it's been good hanging out with you this week. Um, you have any summer drink recommendations? Summer drink? Well, I did. Well, as I just said, I came back from Oregon. So I have, I, I, there was a lot of beer that was in the trail sport okay. coming home. I was stashing at places like it was 1925. Um, just to, just to make sure it got fit all in the car. So I, you know, I, I used to live in Oregon, got used to the beer and it's not the same in Southern California. So I, I came back with a lot. So that's what I'll be emptying a fridge over the course of the summer. All right. That sounds good. I like Oregon beer. Um, if you have any summer beer recommendations, that's podcast <laughs> at autoblog.com. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars on Apple podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get the show, be safe out there and we'll see you next week. 